Romans, the 8th chapter. Um, I want you to see, and I'm going to preface this with, with uh, the fact that I want you to see if we don't lose it, if I don't, if I lose it, then you'll know that it's somewhere in there and you need to figure out what it was. I want you to see this morning where death and resurrection, the matter of death and resurrection lie. Um, it's kind of like a lot of other things in the church, in the, in the, uh, uh, erosion of time. And uh, we come to the place where we lose the true purposes of God. And, and we hold some truths to be the main heaven is God's purpose to get you to heaven. Well, hopefully in the past weeks we figured out, no, that's not right. And, and death and resurrection is another concept that the church has come to look at as, as, as 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 uh, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we that are alive and, and remain shall be caught up. And this is death and resurrection. But that's the that's the effects of death and resurrection. It's not the cause. And if the cause for death and resurrection is not there, the effects of death and resurrection will not be what we deem them to be. What the church certainly teaches. I also want you to see this morning and get a clear picture of the false prophet and the spirit of Antichrist. They will be personified in the book of the Revelation. But I want a clear picture of that to be in our minds this morning. Having said that, from Romans, the 8th chapter, reading from the 4th verse, that the righteousness of God, the righteousness of the law, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In a close look at this, we will see that the Bible is speaking to us very clearly here of two minds. It speaks to us of the mind of the Spirit and the mind of the flesh. Now understanding that the flesh is absolutely correct has to be. There has to be. God created you with a flesh. So flesh is not wrong in itself. Flesh is not evil. Flesh only becomes wrong when it becomes carnal. So flesh is carnal when it's governed by the, mo the mind of man. In Romans, the 12th chapter, just the first two verses, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This speaks of those same two minds. And it speaks of the choice that we make of one or the other of those minds, and which will govern our life. Now, the governing of our life means this mind has control of your body. It is that mind that controls your actions and what you do. I'm not speaking of being possessed by devils and, 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 and spitting pea soup or, or, or throwing it in the fire. I'm talking about what mind brought you to the house. God's word says, forsake not the gathering of yourself together. One mind said this morning, go to church. Now, the other mind could have found excuses that would have been rationalized, very able to rationalize and say, I'm not going this morning. But what mind would that be? Carnal. It would be the mind of the flesh, carnal mind. Because it disobeyed God. What we've done in the church 
is we've allowed that carnal mind and that rationale to disobey God and counted it not as any great consequence because we do this so we don't need to worry about this. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself. It's a, this choice decides who has the body or whose, whose mind this body obeys. Now, we also must understand that these two minds cannot be given, both given a seat. We cannot allow both minds a seat at the table. We cannot allow any kind of a compromise because what ends up happening in those, in those compromises that we see as, well, we can do this so long as we do that or don't do or whatever, then what happens to us is in James 1 it says, Let not that man think he shall ever receive anything from the Lord, of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When we sit down and we allow the mind that is of man a seat at the table, we become, and yet we still approach God, what we become is we become double-minded and God says you'll not receive anything from God with that double mind. Now in Romans 12 too, it said that by the choice of which mind, we give ourselves to, you will either be conformed to this world or transformed to this world. So that we must understand that this world and this world are reached by the mind. And the mind is determined by whom we give this body to. If I give my body to the mind of the flesh, I will be conformed to this world, not because I choose to be conformed to this world, but because that mind is conformed to this world. If I give my body to the spirit that is of God, then I will be transformed to that, not because I make up my mind I'm going to be transformed, but because by my giving this body to that mind, it will take me and transform me by the mighty power of God that, work is, that works within this, this then tells me that this choice of minds determines the two different realms. The realm of this, of this world and the realm of God's world. Now I want you to see the origin of, these, of this, these two realms of choice and the purpose that they are to play in your life. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter... In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and the 11th verse. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now this speaks of the Spirit that is of man, that knows the things of man, and the Spirit that is of God which we receive, that we might know the things of God. And it also speaks of the Spirit that is of the world. This is not three spirits. It's talking about when the Spirit of man is in prominence. It then becomes the spirit of the world and the children of disobedience. But let me, let, me, let me say this to you now. What we're looking at is the spirit that is of man and the spirit that is of God. These are correct. You, these have to be there for you to fulfill God's purpose. God has to have your body, your flesh, to present himself in this world. So the spirit that is of man is absolutely necessary to the spirit that is of God. And the spirit that is of God is absolutely necessary to the spirit that is of man for you to fulfill your purpose. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Yes. All right. Could not do it without it. So this deals with these two realms. 
One of these realms, Genesis 1.29, God told Adam, He said, I give you every fruit-bearing tree upon the face of the earth, and for you that is food, that's meat. Well, He was talking about that, the realm of the natural. And the realm of the natural, this is how it's sustained. Then he said to him in 2.16, uh, he, he put it, placed him in the garden and commanded that every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. This is for the sustaining of the spiritual man. And this is this realm. So these are the two realms that we must understand fully that God is dealing with and that God is wanting us to be fully aware. Man is created to be equally at home. In this realm and in this realm. <clears throat> the spirit that is of man knows this realm. And God put the spirit of man in you that you can know this realm. But he also has given man in, cre in creation's design the spirit that is of God that he can equally know this realm. To know as you're known. So that is how God created you. And it is that very function that is the only connection that there is between the two realms. You, God created to be the only connection. And that connection is the balance of those two spirits held exactly as God created them to be. That perfect balance that God created is the divine order of God. In that balance... Let me just read it. You all have it memorized by now. In that perfect balance of divine order, we find God speaking to Moses, and Moses in his imagery showed us, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and became into four heads. This is the balance of God in man. Bringing God, presenting God to the world. It is man in the image of God that is the only thing that was placed in that garden. And it is that man that is the only thing that, 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 that both realms have in common. Man is formed of this realm, filled with this realm. And through that, he is the image of God. And when this balance is correct, then the calling of man and the pr purpose and will of God goes forth and Eden flows to the world. It is the purpose of man. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. God has one purpose for your life. It is to present Christ. Everything else will come out of that. If God's purpose for you is to be a missionary, to go to some foreign country and, and, and do great service, it is because you allowed God to present Himself in you. And that must begin where you are. Right now, right here, in your day-to-day -day life, I must present Christ. Because if I cannot present Christ right now, right here, I cannot present Christ somewhere else. If I cannot run with the footman today and present Christ in my life, how do I ever think I could run with the horses? And the ministry of man is to allow God to present Himself in you by bringing the spirit that is of man in complete governing of the spirit that is of God. God created you to present Him. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I, he, he said, I live, but yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And this life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. This is that balance perfectly functioning. I live, but not I. 
It's Christ that lives in me. And it's Him that's functioning. That's this realm and this realm connected as God intended. Understanding this balance must be maintained. Because if man is the only thing that can, that can present the righteousness of God in this world, then man is the only thing that can sin. There is no place else that sin can be found except there. And the only sin that you can commit is to not allow God to present Himself, which is His will. Sin is a violation of the balance of the two spirits. It is the spirit of man in anything, no matter how insignificant we might see it. It is when the spirit of man is given preference over the spirit of God. It is a violation of order and it is the, the origin of sin. When man's spirit is man, not in government, but is manifest. When we do this, what happens is we have a double-minded mix. And it's double-minded because it has not, it, uh, it's not abandoning God. It's still claiming His promises. But what's now happening is we're approaching God in, in some mixture of, of what we think is the Spirit of God, but what is in truth the Spirit of man. And we build a religious machine and call it the church. Double spirited. Now understand something. I'm going to tell you exactly why the church is where it is, or God will. When God created you, or created man, to be functional in both realms, He did that by giving man senses to operate in both realms. You've got five senses that we at least recognize uh, in, in the, uh, to operate in this realm that makes you to know the things of man. You, you, you understand your eyes, you, you, you see, you hear, you taste, you touch, you smell. God gave you those senses. Those are the senses of this realm. And He gave you them because God said, I want you to be fully functional in this realm and completely aware and to know the things of the spirit of man. But He also created man with the spirit, that, uh, with the spirit senses that are the spirit that is of God, that I can be at home there. The faith and all the things that are of that are, are inherent in man and created there that I can be equally at home and equally aware of that kingdom yep. and all that it, that it provides. Because until this kingdom is aware of what is provided by this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven cannot reign. It cannot reign. God said, I created you, man, to be at home in either. And that's the, function of, that's the function of man. That's what makes it possible. Adam was created to be equally functional in both realms, completely functional in both realms, uh, with the ab ability to be aware. But in the fall, he lost the senses of that realm. And in losing the senses of that realm, he lost the awareness of that realm. If you lost all of the senses to this realm, you'd be dead. That's what God said. God said, you eat of that tree, now you're going to die. He lost every sense of that world. Every awareness of that world. And it now, everything that can be told him, it comes from outside. And it comes to him as some kind of a fairy tale. The Bible said that the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. They're foolishness to him. Most of the church this morning, you start talking about the uh, supernatural uh, power of God. And it is a fairy tale. Because we are lost these senses and are completely comfortable and governed by the senses of this realm. And we don't even realize that's a double-minded condition.
Adam lost those senses and became conformed to this, to, to this realm. The church today, in its function, we give the new birth to the spirit of man. We give baptism and the gifts and the, and the, uh, the fruit and we ascribe it all to the spirit that is of man. And that spirit that is of man operates and governs it. And, and the promises of, and the things of God are foreign to us. I, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm not trying to berate. Uh, but I'm telling you that we, what we must understand. When, when something happens in this world and, and we need something, uh, we look uh, for an answer. We look for our answers in this realm. Because we are completely governed by this realm. And though the promises of God are something that, oh yes, I believe that God is, but we never look to God for the answers. Because we've lost, and, I, and we must see this. It's not, again, I'm not trying to... to to condemn anybody because the fact is Adam was shut out of that garden. God could not shut Adam out of the garden and say, okay, Adam, you got a problem, buddy, because you don't believe. Uh, because Adam could not believe. He could not believe. He's shut out. He's sealed out. He's kept out. And the only way that we can have restoration is to understand that only God could keep him out and only God could let him in. Only God. But it is God's purpose to do just that, isn't it? In Genesis 3.24, the Bible said that God drove Adam out. Now the word that they used for drove there is the word for divorce. Now if we... What we've got to do is we've got to understand what this meant to God. Because the only way you're going to fix it is to understand what it means to God. God said, I'm divorcing you, Adam. It's a divorce of God and man that took place. In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, it's in the 13th verse, it said... Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both in them... Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God hath raised up the Lord, and He will also raise up by us up by His power. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What know you not that the, the which ye, he that is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. For he that is joined in the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Which is in you which you, you have of God. And you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are God's. God is speaking here of a condition where the spirit of man is governing the body. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, that body belongs to me, but you, the spirit of man is controlling it. That body is mine, he said. You are to glorify me in that spirit and in that body. You are created for one purpose, as vessels to present God in this world, in the body of Christ. God would restore you and I to that Union by that new birth. That's what it is. It's not me signing a paper that says I don't want to go to hell. It's not me allowing Jesus to be my Savior. It's me coming to God and by a miracle born of God, that spiritual, in that spiritual realm, a union takes place that God is once again made one with man. 
If that doesn't happen, it makes no difference what our doctrine says or our membership, the names upon our membership. It makes no difference who joins your church. It makes no difference who dances in the aisles or who falls in them. It makes no difference. Only if God makes me one spirit with Him again. One spirit with God, that union that makes me of the body of Christ. This is the only thing. Adam's sin was because he allowed the spirit of man preference over the spirit that is of God within himself. And in that, the union, it is to that union of one that he was unfaithful. It is to that body of Christ that he committed this fornication. And it is by that, God said, divorce took place. Now God says, I will make you one spirit. And God looks at this completely as marriage. Not like marriage. Marriage is like this. He says, this is marriage. It says in Romans 7, 4 that we must be married to Christ, to God, to Christ. In, in Ephesians in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and the reading from the 30th, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I speak concerning Christ. He said, by being that one union, we become one flesh in the body of Christ. And it is that balance. It is that balance to which we are either faithful or unfaithful. And that body to which we commit fornication. And we do that because we prefer the spirit of man over the spirit that is of God in something in our life. In something. And it becomes in that failure to maintain that balance double, double minded. Double minded actually means double spirited. The word actually means double spirited. Double spirited. Let me now take you to 1 John. I want you to turn there with me. 1 John, the fourth chapter. And I want, I want you to see it, what I'm telling you, though I know you know, in the first verses of that chapter. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because Many false prophets are gone out into the world. If I know you, the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, where you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Already now is in the world. It said, try the spirits and see if they're of God. This is not talking about this is not talking about run out there and find some spirit running around and try it and see if it's of God. This is talking about try the spirits that you deal with every day. Try the spirits and see if those spirits are of God. Because he said the spirit of Christ is there, but there's also the spirit of Antichrist. Now the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Antichrist are the possibilities within every man. They're within you. Try the spirits because you better be careful. There's both are there. Both are talking. The, the, the spirit of man and the spirit that is of God are both there and they're both talking. Now, the difference in the spirit that is of God and the Christ and the spirit that is not of God and is the Antichrist is 
the difference in our version that we present. It's not to say the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is, is, to, is to worship Satan. It's just to present a flawed version of Christ. That's the difference. When the Spirit of God governs, we will present the Spirit of Christ. When the Spirit of man manifests in any way, we then present our version of Christ. Our version of Christ. Our version of Christ, with our own consent, is this false prophet. That is the false prophet. That is the spirit of Antichrist. And we're warned about the spirit. Because see, the spirit of Antichrist is not going to come to you as some horned beast that's going to say to you, why don't you reject Christ, deny Christ, and, and reject God? What he's going to do is he's not going to try to deny to the realm of 216. He's going to try to come to you and get you to reverse the flow. And send 129 into 216. And present them our version. No big deal. And I'm not ready to do that. No big deal. False prophet and the spirit of Antichrist tells us that there is a welfare system of God, and there is not. There is not. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? In this false prophet, and this spirit of Antichrist, he's not going to come to you as a horned beast. He's going to come to you as an angel of light. He's going to come to you as a minister of righteousness. And he's going to come to you with the teaching that prevails in the church today. And I'm even talking about in, in the full gospel, shall we say, or, or, or at least what I have come in contact with, the charismatics, come with a teaching that says that obedience to the commandments is legalism. It comes with a teaching that says, you know, really, all that's necessary is that you love God, love God, make your confession of Christ and believe in Him. That's what's necessary. Now let me speak to these points. No, let Christ speak to these points and reveal to us. Here is the acid test in trying the spirits. In 1 John 3, 24, He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Obedience to God is not legalism. It is, in fact, the first identification that you're being governed by the Spirit that is of God. If that identification is not there, you're not in Him. And if you're not in Him, you'll not be gathered. It is absolutely the first identification of the Spirit that governs in you. If I am one with God, I am in Him, and that means I am led by Him. I am led by Him. If I disobey, as Adam disobeyed, I violate the union, I step outside of that one spirit, I become double-spirited, that is the false prophet and the spirit of Antichrist in your life. And yet, we will let the false prophet and the spirit of Antichrist tell us it's okay it's okay to disobey God. But that's not what he says. 
Look with me at John's Gospel in the 14th chapter and the 23rd verse. Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, he that doesn't love me, doesn't keep my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. You say, well, it's only necessary to love him. And he says very clearly, you cannot love me apart from obedience. If you do not obey my word, you do not love me. It's the false prophet professing a love for God and the spirit of Antichrist prevailing. Let's speak of belief and confession. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and 8, he said, spoke of a people that, that, that he was on their lips, but he was far from their heart. So confession is not something that we can do with our mouth. It's something that must be done with the heart. And in Luke's Gospel, in the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel, there's something here that in the 41st verse, it says, Devils also come out of many, crying and saying, Thou art the Christ the Son of God. And he, re and he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. They confessed that Jesus was the Christ come in the flesh. They fully believed that Jesus was the Christ come in the flesh. But they are fully not of God. Fully not of God. To confess Christ, it says, he that confesses Christ in the flesh is of God. To confess Christ in the flesh is to present Christ in your flesh. He said, be not deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. To confess Christ in the flesh is to present Christ in your flesh. To deny Christ in the flesh is for the spirit of man to be prominent and to present a version of Christ to the world. It is not. It is not this teaching that's in the church today. For that is born of the false prophet and the antichrist. And he said, try the spirits. Now if man alone can present the righteousness of God in this world, then we also know that it is man and man alone where sin can be found in this world. Only in man can sin be found. Think about this. Adam fell in the garden. It was in the garden Adam fell. So that tells me that sin is, was conceived in a sinless place. You see what I'm saying? Sin is conceived in a place where there is no sin. Titus 1.15 said, To the pure, all things, all things are pure. Let me, let me see if I can find it quickly and, and, and just read it. And just read it for you. In Titus, Titus 1.15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. The same thing. Depending on whose hands are holding it. The same thing. Prayer. In the hands of the defiled. Is defiled. Worship in the hands of the defiled. 
is defiled. Revival in the hands of the defiled. The gifts in the hands of the defiled. Church in the hands of the defiled. Is defiled. To the pure. All things are pure. It says in, in 1 Corinthians also. Let me, let me just read that to you. We're almost, we're almost there. 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and the 12th verse says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In the 10th chapter, same book, in the 23rd verse, it says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but, but all things... Edify not. The difference is found in who's handling them. The difference is found in who we present. Who you present. It makes all the difference in sin. The fall, the, the fall took place and nothing was changed but man in that realm. Nothing was changed in that garden. Nothing was changed in that realm. The only thing that was changed was man. And by man, this realm is all completely changed. But think about this. This is what I want you to get. Nothing is changed in that garden or in that realm but man. It said in, in, in Genesis, the second chapter, it said that, that man and Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. But you look at the third chapter of Genesis and it says they knew they were naked and they went and they made covering. What changed? Nothing changed but them. Because the pure had become impure. And now, no matter what you do, it's impure. Doesn't matter how much you approach God, it's impure. The only way back is the restoration that God brings us one spirit in Him again. The moment that Adam changes, everything that's right becomes wrong, everything that's lawful becomes unlawful, unlawful, and Adam is a man that God says, okay, you cannot remain here. He becomes what cannot be there while he was in there. It all took place within him. Everything took place within, within that man. Because the spirit of man was allowed to become prominent and make a choice that preferred itself over the spirit that is of God. And it does not have to be significant in our eyes. It only has to be the preference. He who finds his life, Luke 9.23, he who finds his life shall lose his life. Do you see what that's saying? The moment I prefer the spirit that is of man over the spirit that is of God, I lost. And I lose the senses to operate there and the awareness of that kingdom. And it shuts me out. So, the false prophet and the antichrist spirit comes to make us double-minded. And it's always to try to bring 129 into 216 and make us able to set the standards of what's God and what is not God. Of what goes to heaven or what goes to hell. And God doesn't send anybody. Man chooses to go. But not because that man decided to murder or because he decided to to commit adultery, uh, 
or because he stole, but because he allowed the spirit of man preference over the spirit that is of God. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping, but I'm going to tell you something I never thought of. When you and I allow even the most insignificant preference of the spirit of man over the spirit of God, we are a curse to the world around us. We go forth with a doctrine that damns everybody around us because we allow and teach a Christ and a way to go to heaven that is false. And we cause people to think that road will get me there. That we will be judged by. God will one day as we stand there will say to us, it, that is a curse. No wonder he says that, that that's adversary to God. Only by presenting Christ. Only by letting the spirit that is of God govern, rule, do I present Christ. And it is to that presentation I am either faithful or unfaithful. It is to that body being presented that I commit fornication against. And it is there that I sin. We must try the spirit that speaks to us on a daily basis with the acid test of God. It is not all right to disobey. It is not enough to profess a love, confess a believing, or to call him Savior. We must present him with our very life. And if we do not, that which we call church, we call the house of God, that we call the body of Christ and that we worship as such, is in truth worshiping Satan himself. Through the teachings of the false prophet and the spirit of the Antichrist. We must discard religion. I thank you, Father, for your words. And though they might sound harsh, they are only harsh to those that they come in controversy with. They are not harsh to those who truly love you and seek you. The wilderness that is between where we are and where you've called us to be is for the purpose of removing the Egyptians. Whether they be around us or within us. And I thank you, God, for a clean place. Well, God, where would we be? And I thank you, God, that that clean place is in within, each, within each of us. And I thank you, God, that that which is your purpose, you have supplied the needs. And I pray, Lord, for each of these that hear this word today, that you would make it, that you would make it so crystal clear and burn upon our hearts. And that daily we would look to you. And Lord, to step out of that union of one with you, 
we would realize to be the greatest, the only sin.